Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 6th of March. As always, this is useful. Please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. Just a quick thank you. We did hit 110,000 subscribers this week, so that's pretty awesome. As always, I have the chapters in the description of the video, so you can jump to whatever particular update you really care about. New videos this week, I did kind of a deep dive about zero trust. This conversation comes up nearly everywhere today. So I thought I'd really walk through what it is, maybe what it isn't, and I use some examples of Microsoft technologies as part of what may make up that way of thinking as part of that architecture, but realize it's not just a product or solution. Then a little bit of fun, something much lighter, customizing your GitHub profile, something everyone can do, and it's maybe a good first step if I wanna get involved in Git and understand those types of repositories. On to the new update. So in the storage side, Azure Backup for Files now creates an infinite list. So the way Azure Backup handles Azure Files is it doesn't copy the content to the vault. Instead, it uses the native Azure Files capability to take snapshots, point in time copies of the data. That's very efficient, it's very fast. But obviously that snapshot lives with the Azure files. So previously it may have been possible to accidentally delete those snapshots. That remember Azure Backup is supposed to be maintaining and then purging based on my retention policy. Now Azure Backup as part of that snapshot will create an infinite lease, which is gonna stop you accidentally deleting it. And if it's an existing one, when it tries to do a restore, it will check and again, create that infinite lease to make sure it doesn't get deleted during a restore operation. On the database side, Azure SQL migration. Now this is part of the Azure Data Studio. So this is an extension. And what it's now gonna do is when I'm going to Azure SQL Managed Instance or SQL Server running in an Azure IaaS virtual machine, it's gonna look at the source database and look at the performance, look at the utilization and recommend a SKU, i.e. a VM SKU, that's the best fit based on what it has observed. Azure SQL Hyperscale, remember that's the massively scalable version of SQL with multiple page servers to get large data, huge performance, now has a zone redundant option. So my database will now get replicated over multiple availability zones within the particular region. Now I must specify this at creation time. It's only for the gen five compute SKUs and it's only in certain regions because it is in preview right now. Azure SQL uh, managed instance now has data virtualization. So data virtualization is all about the idea that I may have data in another storage medium. This could be Blob, this could be Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which sits on top of Blob, but adds that hierarchical namespace. So what I can now do is I have data in there, but I wanna be able to run transact SQL, T-SQL commands against it. I don't wanna to have to re-import it back into my regular database. I wanna use it where it is. So what data virtualization does, providing my files are a parquet or CSV format, and there's even ways to do it with JSON um, based on how the documents are returned as rows, I can leave the data where it is, and then through data virtualization still run queries against it. Now, basically I'm gonna go and enable Polybase on my instance and then add the data lake or the blob as an endpoint. Now there's different ways to then reference that external data. There's an open row set option, which is fast, but it's really just for ad hoc queries. I'm not gonna constantly be addressing that data. Or I can actually set up an external table. Now there's more setup involved in that external table. I have to go and create it. But once I've done that, it gives me much richer integrations. I can interact just like a regular table. It's encapsulating that whole access. So if I needed repeated access, then I'm probably gonna use that external table option. But now for Azure SQL Managed Instance, I can, through that data virtualization, interact with files where they are on Blob or Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. And then Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed, I, managed Instance, not Managed Identity, um, now has backup redundancy options. So the default is GRS, it's globally redundant, replicated to the paired region. 
Maybe for cost purposes, I want to reduce that. So I could pick LRS or ZRS. Remember, LRS is three copies in the same data center. ZRS is three copies spread over different availability zones in the same region. Those AZs have independent power calling communications. And ZRS is cheaper than GRS. LRS is cheaper than ZRS. And maybe I don't need that geo replication because maybe my application already does an asynchronous replication to another database instance in the other region. So I already have a backup out there because I have that instance backing up locally as well. I can change this at creation time. I can change this post creation. If I change it post creation, it only applies to backups taken once I've made the change. It's not going to go back and change the redundancy of existing backups but it will go and change it for new ones I take post that change. And then Defender for Cosmos DB uh, is available. The Defender are a whole set of technologies tailored to protect specific types of workloads. And they protect them from the types of vulnerability and attack specific to that workload. There's different types of attack against a storage account compared to compute. So with the Cosmos DB, it's giving me protection from things like SQL injection, um, key extraction, I'm trying to get the access keys. Other types of malicious, suspicious behavior, it's gonna detect and give me protection. So I can now go and turn that on. Miscellaneous, actually a number of Azure AD updates. So the first one is custom roles for app management has gone generally available. Now just to be clear about this, so this is Azure AD custom roles, but it's not every type of role. The emphasis really is here, it's around app registration and enterprise apps. So in my Azure AD, I can go to roles and administrators. I can go and, hey, I wanna create a new custom role. And when I go to the permissions, it's telling me, hey, look, this is only for app registrations and enterprise applications. It's not for everything today. For example, this would be useful if I wanted to give someone the ability to assign users to a particular application. I could create a custom role just with app role assigned to an update permission and then grant it to a user at the scope of a particular application. But that has gone GA. And in the documentation, they did say they are expecting more roles to be added over time. So I think it's gonna get broader as time goes on. Multi-stage access reviews are in preview. So access reviews, let me, as the name suggests, review access to things like group membership, to app assignment, to role assignment. What they now have is the ability to have an additional stage or two additional stages for certain types for groups and applications. Now it is in preview, but what I can do, let me actually jump back over again for a second, is when I'm going and setting up my app review, so I'm gonna go down to identity governance under manage, I'll go and look at access reviews, I'll go and create a new access review, and I'll do it for an application. I'll just pick any application, it doesn't really matter. But the whole point is under the reviews, now no, it's normally I just pick reviewers, that, that's my option. But I have this little thing up here hey, preview multi-stage review. If I turn this on, it instantly adds a second stage. And I have the option of adding an additional stage. So if I click that, now I have three. Three is the maximum. There's no add another one. And then for each of those stages, I can specify the number of days of its duration and who the reviewers are. So it lets me have more flexibility in that overall review configuration, review escalation. And I do have the option if I wanted to, to disable the reveal of the review results from the previous phases. So maybe I don't want the reviewers of phase two or three to see the, how the reviewers previously specified and answered. So I can turn off that reveal if I wanted to. So just something nice there. Also another thing, just while I'm here, the workbooks are super powerful in Azure AD and they've added a new one. So if I go down to monitoring workbooks, what they've added is one all about authentication prompts. So I see it down here in the corner, authentication prompts. And it's actually authentication prompts analysis. And it's gonna show me what are the types of prompts people in my tenant being prompted for. So hey, I can see, oh, okay, maybe password, but I might see authenticator, application. I can see things like, hey, 
you're not using legacy authentication. So I see all these details. Hey, good, you've got no legacy TLS or non-interactive TLS, but it gives me huge amounts of data. Now mine's pretty boring, just because my tenant's pretty boring. But this is a really nice place to go if I'm trying to get an understanding of, look, what are people doing? How are they interacting as part of my authentication evolution of what I'm trying to do in my tenant? So go and take a look at that workbook. Azure AD Graph API Retirement has been pushed. So there's different ways to interact with Azure AD. What we wanna to move to is the Microsoft Graph. And there's a Graph API, there's a Graph Endpoint, there's PowerShell commandlets for Graph. And originally they were gonna retire, I think it was end of June, the Azure AD Graph API. They have pushed it out to at least the end of the year. So then the old PowerShell modules for Azure AD and MS Online, they're gonna to continue to keep running as well for a bit longer. Uh, the ADAL will continue running for a bit longer. You should still get off of these things, but I think maybe there was maybe some pushback about the time it's gonna take people to move. So you should still be moving to Microsoft Graph. That is the direction for all of those interactions. But hey, they've pushed back that retirement a little bit further. Also remember they did announce Azure AD Connect as soon as a new version comes out, the older ones within 12 months will no longer be supported. And currently for the V2s, they don't auto update. So make sure you are staying on top of that. And that's it for this week. So I hope that was useful as always. Until next video, take care.